Hey everyone, welcome to my shop and welcome to one of my largest builds today on this channel. For the last year or so, I've dedicated my time to focusing on shop related projects, all with the goal of having a functional shop that could better build projects just like this one. Before taking this past year to focus on improving my workshop, I found myself getting really frustrated because it felt like my workshop wasn't aiding me in building furniture, but instead it felt like it was really just kind of hindering my ability to easily flow through the building of a project. I'm not sure if that idea of flowing through a project makes sense to you, but I think having a more fully established workshop allowed me to find a, a rhythm in this project that easily let me flow through the process of building this bookshelf and just made the whole experience way more enjoyable. Instead of fighting against my shop, it felt like my shop was just another tool helping aid in the journey of building this bookshelf. Anyway, I want to talk more about this idea throughout the video, but for now I want to talk about what I'm currently doing on the screen. So I went and picked up two 10 foot boards of rough sawn ash wood from my local lumber yard, which if you happen to live in the southwest area of Ohio and are looking for a lumber yard that ships lumber, you should check out CR Mutterspaw Lumber. They have no idea I'm mentioning them or are affiliated with this video in any way. I just think they're a cool family run lumber yard and wanted to support them by shouting them out. Anyway, the first thing I like to do with a big project like this is to lay out on the rough wood where each piece of the shelf is coming from. Now this helps me in a couple ways. First, it ensures that I did all my prep work correctly and then I bought enough material to be able to yield all the pieces I'll need to build this bookshelf. And second, it makes the milling process just way easier for me. By having a visual tracing of each piece of the bookshelf, it just makes it really easy to quickly break down these larger boards into the more rough individual component pieces. Plus, with everything laid out, I can better see if I need to first make one long rip cut or if it would make more sense to first make a handful of cross cuts that you'll see me do later on. And lastly, it just makes everything way more organized. But doing this all at once, double checking my measurements now, and writing on the board what part of the bookshelf is what, it means later on I'll save the time of having to remeasuring things over and over and can quickly know what part of the shelf I'm working on and what the board is supposed to be. I believe that our brains are not meant to be databases just storing as much info as possible. So if there's any way for me to write something down or draw something out in this case, then I'll try to do that. So with everything laid out, the next day I could begin breaking everything down and milling everything flat and square. And here it's where we need to talk about the elephant in the room, or I should say the multiple machines in a shop focused primarily on hand tool woodworking. Maybe this will be a disappointment to some of you, but going forward this channel won't be a purely hand tool focused shop slash channel. Instead it will be what I'm calling a hybrid woodworking shop. I think I've seen some people speak about hybrid woodworking before, but for me my definition and what you can expect from this channel is using machines to break down, join, and flatten boards to final dimensions, and then using my hand tools for the remaining joinery work. Before buying a bandsaw, jointer, and thickness planer, I did all my mill work with hand planes and panel saws, and I'm uh, glad to have experienced and learned how to mill rough lumber by hand, but it is for sure not my favorite thing to do. It just takes a very, very long time. I do this all as a serious hobby, and with the limited time I have out in the shop, I want to spend that time doing the things I enjoy the most, which is by far cutting joinery by hand and not spending hours and hours resawing boards and planning boards by hand. There may be times for small boxes and other small projects where I stick solely to hand tools for the entire project, but with a project of this size, it just makes more sense with the time I have to use machines for all the millwork so I can quickly get to the fun part of using my hand planes and my chisels to cut joinery. And honestly, it's, it's just encouraging and more fun process to spend just a couple days on millwork for all the pieces instead of the full weeks of work I used to spend just to get to the point of having square, flat piece of board to work with. It means I'm spending more time doing what I like, and then I'm able to make more projects within a year, which is also fun because there's a lot of projects I want to get to and make. So again, I don't really consider myself a hand tool purist, but a hybrid hand tool woodworker, which actually I think is what Paul Sellers is too, and he's kind of viewed as the epitome of the classic hand tool woodworker. Have you ever noticed that all his tutorials start with pre-milled pieces and only focus on the hand tool joinery work? 
I know he has a machine shop, and I expect he does the same thing I'm doing with milling all boards via machines and then doing the rest by hand. Which makes me consider doing something similar where my future videos pick up with boards milled to final dimension and only focus on the joinery work instead of showing all the millwork process. This is a question I go back and forth on because I like getting to show the full journey of rough lumber to final project, but I also have a feeling most people don't enjoy seeing boards run through machines, not to mention that the milling process is always the same process and doesn't really change from project to project. So what do you all think? Would you like to see the full process of including mill work or would you rather my videos pick up with pre-milled boards focused only on the journey? joinery work. But anyway, speaking of millwork, something I struggled with on this project was getting these long boards flat. I tried to do the whole planar sled technique to get one side flat, but no matter how many wedges I used, I didn't seem to be able to get the board flat. It remained bowed, which was quite frustrating. Now, this was my first time trying this technique, and I know people usually use hot glue to keep everything in place, but uh, in my stubbornness, I just didn't really want to do that. And I tried just getting away by using some blue tape, which maybe was the issue, maybe it wasn't, I don't know. Or maybe the wood was just too thin and it was going to bow no matter what. I really don't know what the problem was, so if any of you smarter people out there watching know what I did wrong, please let me know in the comments. So I'm going to interrupt myself here and confess to you that I did not actually get the bow out of these longer pieces of wood. I tried with the hand plane and that wasn't seeming to work and I eventually ran into this problem where I was getting super close to my final thickness and so I didn't want to keep taking off more wood to the point where I went past my final thickness, end up ruining these longer pieces of wood, get more ash wood which was expensive, so I just didn't want to do that. And here's where I think that it won't actually be a problem. I know it's important to have very uh, straight and true wood, but thankfully these vertical pieces are going to be the sides of a, of a hanging shelf that I can use the length of the shelves to kind of squeeze everything together when I go to glue up. And as long as everything in the middle is at the same length, it should bring everything really into uh, squareness. And that's my hope, at least. Obviously, it's not ideal, but thankfully, this is just a piece for myself. And I ultimately don't think that having the shelf a little out of square is going to matter. Thank you, past self, for your insightful words. As I said in the past there, I didn't think the boards being slightly bowed would be an issue, and now after finishing the project and knowing the bookshelf is indeed slightly out of square, I can confirm it wasn't an issue and nobody but myself is ever going to know the bookshelf isn't perfectly square. Now this is something I've been thinking about more and more and that I'm still trying to figure out, and that is where and when does something need to be perfect in a project. I think Instagram and YouTube and maybe just the general social media culture can sometimes lead to this obsession with everything needing to be so perfect, when in reality I'm not sure a project needs to be meticulously perfect in every way to still be considered a fine piece of furniture. It's kind of funny, I just finished up a dog bowl stand for my sister-in-law that was made out of pine from Home Depot and since it was a piece I knew it would probably get a little beat up and just wasn't this elaborate jewelry box or some other piece you would consider as being fine furniture. I didn't put all this pressure on myself while building it to ensure everything was perfectly square and all the tenons were perfectly cut and everything was perfectly neat. Instead, I just sort of enjoyed knocking out a quick little project that was going to be a gift to my sister-in-law. Now don't get me wrong, I still took care and strove to build it with excellence, but I didn't worry too much about if a tenon was cut a little loose and a little out of square, if there was a little chip out on the final project, which there was. And you know what? I loved building that little dog bowl stand. I just felt free to enjoy being in the shop building a special project with my hands. And the most important thing is, even though when I looked at the final result and saw all these little things wrong with it, when I showed it to my sister-in-law, she was absolutely floored and over the moon with excitement. She thought it was the most beautiful thing and couldn't wait to start using it, and went on and on about how great it looked. But you want to know what she didn't mention? All those little things that I look and see wrong with it. The whole experience just made me think about all the time I sometimes spend agonizing over something being perfect, when at the end of the day, the person the project is for is most likely never going to know or quite frankly care about if the thing I'm agonizing over is perfect or not. Now, I know a little dog bowl stand and a nice heirloom piece of fine furniture 
for completely different types of projects, and I still think I'd want to strive for a greater level of execution in an heirloom piece of furniture someone is maybe spending thousands of dollars on. But I think the question is still relevant on when is perfect necessary and when is maybe close enough sufficient. But I don't know, even saying that feels wrong, because I feel like I have this wiring in me that is screaming out, that's not right, everything you do should be the utmost excellence and you should never settle for good enough. But again, getting back to what started all this, I spent all this time trying to get a board perfectly flat when it was only ever so slightly twisted, and at the end of the day, the slight twist didn't matter, and I guarantee even a master woodworker wouldn't be able to tell the board wasn't perfectly flat when looking at the final product. So I think the question still remains, is it sometimes okay for things to be close enough? And I think something I'm still trying to figure out is when in a project is it okay for something to be close enough, and when is it truly important for something to be absolutely perfect? And speaking of perfect, one area in my work where I personally strive for perfection is in my dovetails. I know this goes against everything I just said about the customer probably never noticing a small gap in the dovetail or about how small gaps won't change anything about the structural integrity of the joint. But for whatever reason, I just love dovetails and have this personal challenge within me to want to be able to cut nice, clean, tight dovetails by hand. And as a result, I feel like I'm on this mission to figure out the best way I enjoy cutting them, and therefore, every time I cut dovetails, it feels like I'm doing something different. This time around, I chose to use the blue tape trick to see if that would help me to see where to cut and where not to cut better. And you know, I'm not sure I really like the blue tape trick. I think it does make it really easy to see where I should be cutting to, but I also think having a knife wall or a pencil line is just as sufficient of a marker to see where I should be and should not be cutting. The benefit of just using a pencil line too is that I don't have to take the time to add blue tape to the edge of the board, which is somewhat time consuming and breaks the flow of cutting dovetails for me. If you haven't picked this up already, I put a high value on efficiency. And therefore, anything even as simple as taking a minute or two to add blue tape onto a board feels like an inefficient use of time. So I'm not sure I'll be sticking with the blue tape trick in the future. I think a better trick to try for cleaner dovetails is simply investing in a nice dovetail saw. I keep telling myself I'm going to buy one, but spending money is kind of hard for me, so we'll see how much longer it takes before I buy a nice one. But I do think buying a nice dovetail saw would really help me in making cleaner, nicer dovetails. Anyway, something new I did with this cabinet, which is pretty fun to try out, was that I cut some miter dovetails. You'll see here in a bit, but I needed to cut a groove and some rabbits along the back edge of the case to make room for shiplap. And so I wanted to have that mitered edge so that I could more easily cut the grooves and rabbits by going from end to end of the board, instead of having to stop before cutting into the dovetails. The miter dovetails were a little tricky to wrap my head around at first, but after the first couple, the rest came a lot more naturally. Thankful they were cut on the backside though of the cabinet because they were far from perfect and only a couple of them had a final nice mitered edge look and the rest had some pretty large gaps that would have not looked the best if they were on the front edge of the cabinet. But it was still a fun learning experience and something I think I'm going to continue to do for my cabinets on the backside so I can more easily cut grooves and rabbits along the back of my cabinets. So once the dovetails were complete, I got to assemble the case and got my first look at the size of the case and was very pleased with how it looked. This is also by far the biggest project size-wise I've ever built and it was fun to be working on something a little larger than what I'm usually building in a shop. So I talked about hybrid woodworking before and another benefit of investing in a bandsaw, jointer, and planer is that it allows me to build projects of this size. I'm not saying I couldn't have built this project at this size using just hand tools, but realistically, it would have taken so much time to do all the milling by hand that it just, it just wouldn't have been fun for me. And once again, this is just a hobby for me, and so with the limited time I have in the shop, I want to be spending that time doing the things I enjoy, not spending hours planing wood and resawing boards by hand. And speaking of hybrid woodworking, at the beginning of this video, I talked about taking about a year to build my workshop in hopes that a more established workshop would help me better build furniture, 
And now having built this bookshelf, I can confidently say that taking that year to work on my shop was very much well worth it. It really felt like my workshop was an extension of me and was another tool helping me to build this bookshelf. One of the biggest things that contributed to that was deciding to keep the car in the driveway and officially taking over half of the garage from my shop. Before working from home, it was important for me that I kept our second car in the garage. But once I started working from home and began using our second car less and less, it began to spend more and more time just sitting in the driveway because I would get tired of moving the car out, in and out, any time I wanted to work in the shop. I originally thought I would set up my workshop so that all my power tools and mobile bench could move to the side and that I could bring the car in and out each day. But eventually, I just decided that who am I kidding? That car isn't ever going to come back in the garage, and this half of the garage is officially my shop. I'm so thankful to get to have a garage to work in, and I think it's the perfect size for the type of work I do. One of the most important shop projects I built in the last year was my mobile workbench that sits in the center of my shop. It acts as the hub in which all other tasks revolve around it. I didn't realize this when I first built it, but having a secondary bench slash workspace is so important to have in a shop because it serves so many purposes. You saw this at the beginning, but while I was working on milling boards, the center bench was in a perfect location for storing all the boards and giving me easy access to them while I ripped boards down on the bandsaw, jointed boards on the jointer, and then ran them through the planer. And then once the boards were milled, you then saw how the center bench was perfect for continuing to store my boards while I took individual pieces over to my hand tool bench to cut the joinery. And then finally, in a similar way, you can see now how the center bench was perfect for having the bookshelf assembled on another surface, and that just freed up my hand tool bench so that I can work on other parts, but it still gave me the ability to easily reference the assembled project for measurements or checking the fit of drawers as you'll see me do later on. And the best part of the center bench, and why I think having a smaller shop is sometimes better, is that the center bench is only a step away from whatever I'm working on, which really helped create a nice flow in building this bookshelf that I talked about at the beginning of this video. So the other big shop project that I'm thankful I took the time to build was my hand tool workbench. I love my new bench. It isn't perfect and there's things I want to change and maybe wish I would have done differently, but it was so nice to use hand tools on a nice sturdy bench. And that's the biggest thing I like about it. It is solid as a rock. My old bench would flex while I used my chisels, and while I planed or did any resawing, the entire bench would literally move off the wall slightly, which just isn't helpful while using hand tools. So having a rock solid work surface to work on makes life so much easier. I also really like all the drawers I added. I'm still figuring out where I want to put everything, but just having a place to store different things like screws or pencils or drills and all those other things that us word workers use on a project all at once in one place to be able to access them easily really made life easier and added to that overall project flow that I keep talking about. Now, one thing I did notice while working on this project that is a high priority that I want to figure out is a better way to cut grooves and rabbits. As you saw, I kind of had a jerry-rig solution for cutting the grooves on the case on my mobile bench, and as you'll see later for cutting the shiplap, and what I really need is a solution for doing this at my hand tool bench. This is the biggest gripe I have with my bench right now. Traditionally, grooves are cut by holding the piece between a tail vise and a dog hole, or at least I most commonly see them done that way. But unfortunately, I don't have a tail vise right now, and where you would usually put one is where I have my face vise. I could move my face vise to the right of the bench where it really should be, but that would put me working up against the wall and make it hard to film things. So I've been trying to fit the tail vise into my right side of the bench, which will make some work, but I think possible. Or something I'm maybe considering is to create a mini grooving workbench that I could place on top of the existing bench when I need to cut grooves. I like the idea of not having to bring out an extra jig though to cut grooves, so I think I'm going to try to figure out a way to update my current bench to be able to cut grooves. Overall though, I'm really happy with my bench and I've been really happy that I took a year or so from making furniture to take the time to think through and build out my shop. I would highly, highly suggest that you are frustrated with your shop and don't feel like it is aiding but hindering you and getting in your way to take some time to figure out what needs to change and make that change. 
There's nothing better than being able to get into a groove or flow and moving naturally from one step to the next while building a project. So as I finish up the sliding dovetail, I want to move on to talking about wood color slash wood grain slash figure selection when building a project. The process of selecting boards based off their wood color or the figure of the grain is not something I feel like gets talked about a lot in YouTube videos I've seen, but is one of those small details that can really take a project to that next level. Something I find fascinating about working with wood is the fact that it is a natural material and as a result, one board is never going to look the same as another. For example, I picked up two pieces of ash wood from the lumber yard, and even though they are both cut from ash trees, the color of each board looked vastly different. One board had a very light, almost white hue to it, while the other had a darker oranger slash light brown color. And even though they are both considered ash wood, they very likely could have come from two different species of ash trees, resulting in a different wood color. But even in the same exact species of trees, you can still have varying shades of color from one tree to the next. Anyway, the reason I'm bringing this up is because while working on the shiplap, I ran into a frustrating issue of having a majority of the boards from the darker ash wood and only a couple boards made from the lighter ash wood. I originally thought when laying out what would be what at the beginning of this project, that I could intersperse the different colored shiplap boards to create an organic looking back. But in reality, there was too much contrast between the two types of boards that instead of being a subtle organic contrast, it was this jarring contrast in which the white wood stood out way too much from the darker ash wood and was too distracting from the overall project look. I lucked out in the end that I was able to put the whiter wood on the very ends of the back and it just so happened that this matched the lighter half of the cabinet sides so that they created this more natural dark to light to dark transition. In this instance, I got lucky and everything worked out, but the experience really made me think about the importance of taking into consideration the wood selection process while starting and building a project. I feel like the wood slash grain selection is really where the art and the art of woodworking comes into play, because I feel like I'm only beginning to scratch the surface of a really complex part of the furniture making process. For instance, I just talked about the color of the boards, and even then I talked about how I didn't like the contrast look, but depending on the project, selecting boards of the same species or different species with loud, bold contrast could really elevate the final look of a project. And then there's the actual figure of the grain. Do you pick a simple straight grain board that is going to blend in, or do you pick a board with lots of figure to pop and stand out? And how do you combine that with the color contrast of the wood you're using? And how's all this going to work with the overall form and function of the design of the piece? All these questions are again where I think the art form and furniture making comes in and is something I would like to learn, study, and be more mindful of in future projects. So one of the last things to do for this bookshelf was to build the two drawers. Drawers are funny to me because they seem like such a simple thing, but are deceptively complex in reality. They're basically their own little project within the bigger project that require building a square box, finding some way to join the box together, ensure everything is square, and then find some way to put a bottom on the box. Then once all that is done, you have to glue it all up, let it dry, clean up the glue, and then get the perfect fit into the drawer recess. I oftentimes feel like I'm coming to the end of a project when I get to the drawers, only to realize that no, I still have a decent amount of work left to finish up the project. But building and fitting drawers is a process where I think hand tools really excel and outshine machine work. The ability to make very subtle adjustments to the length or width of the board via hand tools can allow you to really narrow in that final perfect fit. As you saw, I was able to take increasingly smaller and smaller passes with my plane until I got the drawer front just barely fitting into the drawer cavity. And as you'll see later, once the drawer is assembled, I can do the same thing until the drawer is just barely able to fit into the drawer recess. So not only do hand tools provide the ability to inch up to the perfect fit, but I also find that they allow for a lot of forgiveness when things don't turn out perfectly square. For instance, the drawer cavities on the shelf are not perfectly square. Normally you would want a nice square hole for your drawer to fit into, 
but if things don't turn out that way, it's not a problem when using hand tools to fit the drawer, because I can take my plane and only take off a little bit of material on one end of the board so that my square board will end up matching my not square hole. This is the same when everything is glued up at the end. If the drawer recess gets narrow as it goes towards the back of the cabinet, this isn't a big deal, since all I need to do is take a little bit more of material off the back of the drawer to match the slant of the drawer recess. I really like this about hand tools, because it means I can be a little bit more forgiving to myself early on in the project, and not put so much pressure to have everything perfectly square, because I can always fix any little imperfections later on with my hand tools. So as I finish up these drawers and put the final finishing touches on this bookshelf, I always like to think back on a project and think about what I learned or what I want to practice on moving forward in my next projects. And in this case, I think there are two big things I learned. First, is to not put so much pressure into making sure everything is perfect. I already talked about this when I spoke about making the dog bowl stand for my sister-in-law. But after reflecting more about that process and now having given the final dog bowl stand to her, it has really made me think about why I make furniture in the first place. I love the process of designing, making plans, figuring out dimensions, and actually building a piece of furniture. But I also love being able to bring joy to someone's life by making and giving them a piece of handcrafted furniture. It's a really special thing to think that I may be making a piece of furniture that might get used by someone for multiple generations. My wife and I have a piece of furniture that was used in her grandma's house, and it's a special thing for us to have that can always remind us of her granny. And it's cool to think that the furniture I build might end up being a special piece like that to a grandchild someday. And as I said before about the dog bowl stand, when my sister-in-law saw the dog bowl stand, or when I look at that piece of furniture from my wife's granny, I don't notice or nitpick all the slight imperfections in the piece. So if the imperfections don't matter at the end of the day, then I don't want to stress and worry about the imperfections when building a piece of furniture. It just doesn't make sense to me to worry about something that's not even going to matter at the end of the day. So moving forward in future projects, I'm going to try to be more relaxed when working on projects and not allow myself to get caught up in any slight imperfections along the way. And the second thing I'm taking away from this bookshelf build is wanting to focus more on the design and use of materials in future projects. I talked about how I didn't exactly like the wood color choice for this project, and in future projects I want to consider wood color and grain selection more when designing the overall piece. I also want to continue to develop my own style and design. I love building pieces like this that are smaller in size and usually multifaceted with different small drawers and shelves. I'm really inspired by Mike Pekovich's work and love the boxy, grid-like work he does. I'm not even sure exactly what style his is considered to be, but whatever it is, I think it's just visually compelling to me and something I really want to take as inspiration and craft my own similar design style. I feel like my workshop and my skills in woodworking has gotten to a place where I can begin to shift my focus more towards the design of furniture and less on the actual how to build a piece of furniture. Not that I don't think I have more skills to, to develop, but simply that I feel like there's more room to begin focusing and learning more about furniture design. And that's the final thing I want to say is how cool it is to look back on my skills or what I was building two or three years ago to what I was able to accomplish with this bookshelf. It's really fun and exciting to see how far my woodworking skills have come. It makes me want to continue practicing and building more furniture. It makes me think of an expression I heard a while ago that says, you'll never accomplish what you'd hope for in a year, but you'll accomplish more in five years than you could ever dream possible. A saying has always stuck with me because for whatever reason, I feel like it's true. It seems within a year, it can sometimes feel like I didn't accomplish what I hoped I would. But then I get to moments like this, when I look back a couple years in this case, to when I first started woodworking seriously, and I'm amazed by how far my woodworking skills have come, and the types of projects I'm able to accomplish. So for any of you that have stuck with me this long in the video, I'll leave you with this. First, thanks for watching and, and listening as always to my workshop ramblings. And second, that whatever you're trying to accomplish in life right now, I challenge you to keep at it and find ways to simply just enjoy the journey. Because I can guarantee if you keep at it, that in two, three, five years, you won't believe where you are and how much you've accomplished.